say. To all participants of today's IS speaker event, I hope uh, all of you are doing well and are ready for the weekend. Uh, my name is Matthias and I will be today's host. That being said, I'm delighted um, to welcome Jeff Tausen live from Bangkok. Uh, good afternoon, Jeff. Um, uh, pleasure to have you here. And before I properly introduce our guests, let me briefly say a few words about the Asian European Society Munich, as always. Uh, we are a nonprofit Munich based student society that aims to foster the mutual understanding between students from Asia and Europe. And therefore, our team of roughly 45 people organizes a lot of different events, such as today's one. So, if you want to learn more about us, you can visit our website, aesmuc.de, or follow us on social media. Um, having said that, for those of you who do not know Chef yet, I will say a few sentences about him. So Chef is a private equity investor, PK, Peking University professor, best-selling author and keynote speaker. Uh, further, he's a leading voice on the digital China and Asia latest uh, trends, and he's also the host of Chef's Asia Tech Club. Um, before going to China, Chef was the head of direct investments for Middle East, North Africa, and, and APEC for Prince Alvali. Uh, who was nicknamed as the Arabian Warren Buffett. Uh, Chef holds an MBA from Columbia, MB from Stanford, and a BA in physics. Uh, he's a huge fan of Starbucks and anything Marvel, and what I found particularly impressive, an ex-Burger King employee, he claims he can make 100 burgers in an hour. Um, perfect. Uh, before we start with our conversation, let me uh, finally elaborate on the structure of today's session. We will start the off microphone with, a, with a, can you hear me? Can you not hear me? Oh, there you with are. A, yeah, with a 15 minute uh, keynote from uh, Jeff and afterwards we will then uh, do Q&A. Uh, again, Jeff, a uh, pleasure to have you today. We really appreciate it and I would hand over to you so you can um, share your thoughts. Okay, thank you very much for being here uh, and for joining in. There might be a little bit of an internet thing. It's, it's dodged in and out a couple times. If I suddenly disappear, <laughs> which is not uncommon in Bangkok, especially when it rains, uh, give me three to five minutes and I'll, I'll, I'll be down on a Wi-Fi down the street. So <laughs> if I suddenly disappear, hang on. Um, it's one of the nice things about living in Bangkok. It's beautiful, it rains every day, but every now and then the power of the internet just goes out. So um, let's see who's here. Anyways, thank you. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's sort of nice to talk to you. And I think you're, you're looking at a great subject. I, I think many of you are in Asia, many of you are in Europe, or, or with an eye on Asia. And the whole digital Asia, China, Indonesia, Thailand, I mean, it's just taking off. It, it's like, it's just an exciting subject and things are happening every week. Facebook is buying companies or at least investing in companies in the last week and a couple of them in the last month in India, now Indonesia. So there's a lot going on. So you're in a cool space if this is something you're thinking about. Uh, my background is, is obviously I do a lot of strategy work. Started a lot on China and then it's become more of an Asia thing because what we saw in China in many cases is being replicated. Thailand, Southeast Asia, uh, increasingly India, uh, frontier Asia, like Myanmar, Sri Lanka, places like this. We can kind of see this pattern moving out. And I think it's a lot more interesting than what's going on in the U.S. I'm an American, so I'll criticize the U.S. in that sense. On the consumer side, things are really great. TikTok, Huawei, uh, all of these companies. These are all Asia, China stores. So anyways, I thought what I'd talk about for about 15 minutes. So just briefly kind of what I'm keeping my eye on, like where I think the next sort of big events are gonna happen coming out of China, Asia, digital. Uh, and I, I think this is, a, I think I'm hopefully right, but this is my short list, this is what I'm watching. So if you look sort of in the e-commerce world, because I think e-commerce in China, Asia, it is clearly starting to merge with social media. It used to be two things, right? Amazon, Facebook, e-commerce, social media. And Alibaba, China, these companies, these things are all intertwined now. They're not that different. And now we can see Mark Zuckerberg moving Facebook into e-commerce fairly rapidly into payments. I think he's almost getting more traction outside of the U.S. than he's getting inside of the U.S. But within this sort of mass of social media meets e-commerce, meets influencers, meets live streamers, all of this, 
you know, what's kind of exciting, what, what I think is happening next. So the one everyone's been talking about for the last year is, big surprise, live streaming short video. Just as a type of media, as a platform for influencers, as a wide, a way to integrate in with e-commerce and to tell more interesting and complicated stories as a brand or a merchant, those two types of media, short video, live streaming, have just been a huge part of the story for the last two years, really. Uh, and now it's bubbled beyond China. It went to Asia. And now we see TikTok going everywhere. So it's becoming a global thing. But it really, it started out of Asia. So I, I think most of the world has caught up to the fact that live streaming and short video combined with e-commerce, social media, influencers, KOLs, KOCs, it's just a big deal. Okay, that's very 2019. 2020, there's sort of three I'm looking at. Uh, first one is group buying, which is, you know, kind of started in the, in the West with Groupon. You know, but it, it kind of faded as an idea. I mean, you see it, but you don't see flash sales as much. You don't see companies like Pinduoduo, which really built itself on the back of group buying. The, and, and group buying very quickly became known as social commerce. Like instead of buying tissues for yourself, which is like Pinduoduo's number one item a year and a half ago. No, you invite three of your friends, you buy together, and then you get a discount. So they, they started calling it social commerce, but really Pinduoduo is tied with Tencent their strategic partners. So it's really WeChat commerce is what was going on. Uh, but internet connection is unstable. I can, I can hear you very well, Jeff. Uh, Jeff okay. Keep on talking. <laughs> a little flag just popped up. Uh, so we saw Pinduoduo as an exercise of group buying, but we've seen you know, we've seen Jingdong JD jump into this by tying in with WeChat. And I think this is what Mark Zuckerberg, basically, he's moving in this direction in Indonesia with this Facebook investment into Gojek. Gojek is kind of the Meituan of Indonesia, a full suite of local services, everything you could want. Ship a package, ride a bike, pay your utility bill, hire someone to come clean your house, the whole suite of services, that's Gojek in Indonesia, very similar to Meituan in China. Pairing that with social media, that gets you something like group buying. And you know, group buying has a couple powerful tools. The first of all, it lets you offer a discount. And anytime you can offer a discount, especially in the developing economy, you generally get a lot of traction. So hey, if you buy this with three of your friends, it's cheap. It's a good lever. It doesn't always last very long. Um, that's what Pinduoduo did. Now they're moving out of that a little bit. That's what Xiaomi did when they started offering smartphones in 2012 that were cheaper than the iPhone. Coming in cheap is a good way to get some market entry. Uh, it doesn't last forever, but I think group buying gets you that. But, but really the reason people get excited about group buying is because it's inherently viral, right? It's the same way Zoom is inherently viral. The very usage of the product itself gets you more customers. It turns every one of your customers into a sales agent effectively. So, you know, if you want to buy something on Pinduoduo, you call two of your friends, you're effectively becoming a sales agent for the company. And Zoom does the same thing, right? To sign up for Zoom, you want to have a call, you have to invite your buddy, he has to sign up for Zoom. Anytime you can turn hundreds of thousands of millions of people on your platform into your sales agent, it's a very powerful growth mechanism. So that's group buying in a nutshell. That's how I think about it. It's mostly virality. Plus it gets you a discount. And I think it does something which is increasingly important, which is this idea of stop thinking about your customers as a demographic. You know, a lot of people come into KFC to buy chicken customers. Start thinking of your customers as a network, that the connections between people that come into your restaurant are more important than anything you might say to them. Uh, Pinduoduo is a very network-focused product. Zoom is a network-focused product. It plays on the interactions between people more than anything else. And that's a lot of what we see in China is a massive connected network of consumers. Uh, the number I always use is like, 
China has three to four times as many consumers as the United States, you know, 330 million to 1.4 billion. But if you look at the connections between consumers, because everyone's on their smartphone, they're all connected, the connections are 17 times greater. So the power of the network is exponentially larger than an increase in just size of your demographic. So these companies like Group Buying, Pinduoduo, Zoom, uh, they're really, they're network focused products. That's a big deal. I think that's the right way to look at China, uh, consumer wise. So that's number one, keep a lookout for these sort of network focused and group buying products. I think we're gonna see a lot more of that in Southeast Asia in the next year. Uh, number two, mini programs. Mini programs is a funny little word that WeChat came up with. Everyone's on Messenger, we have payment, that's WeChat Pay. Let's put a lot of little mini programs, which are basically scaled down mobile apps within WeChat, and suddenly they have hundreds of thousands of millions of them. And if you want to sell something in China, you don't build a web page. I mean, forget building a web page. And you probably don't even build a mobile app. You build a mini program first, and you put it within WeChat, and then maybe you build a mobile app. Uh, why mini programs are important. It's basically embedding e-commerce within a super app, within a um, social network. Uh, the reason that's important is because it's a counter strategy to the traditional way of doing e-commerce, which is we're Alibaba, we're Amazon, we're a marketplace, and we serve as the place, we serve as sort of the gateway between merchants and users, and we control the interface. So if you open a store on Taobao or if you open a store on Tmall, that's basically like renting a space in a shopping center. You rent the space, you refurbish it, you do marketing, you try and sell, and every year they come back to you and they say, well, we're increasing the rent, my friend. And the cost of being there keeps going up. That's Amazon, that's Alibaba, that's JD. Many programs within WeChat and probably many programs within Facebook that's like selling the space. That's like having your own building where you're not renting a store in the mall. You've bought the store. So it's a, it's a counter strategy to this idea of a network that controls the ecosystem. If you have a spot on WeChat, you own it. It's yours. It's like infrastructure. Uh, and that's a very po powerful move against this traditional model. So merchants like this idea of instead of just going through Taobao or Tmall, and every year I have to spend more to get the same traffic to my store, I'll also open a mini program within WeChat, and I own that. That's my place. That's It's a pretty great move, and I think that's what Facebook is going to try and do against Amazon, maybe. So watch for mini programs. We're seeing them everywhere. Alipay is starting its own mini programs. So Alipay could very much look like WeChat. Uh, I think Gojek will end up doing what effectively appears to be mini programs. So this, it's this idea of moving towards a super app. Uh, it started with WeChat and we're seeing that move, but it's a pretty powerful move, the whole uh, mini programs thing. And it's, it's a problem for places like Amazon in particular, or not Amazon, uh, Android. Because the idea was you have a smartphone and Android controls the screen because they have the operating system and iOS controls the screen of your iPhone. They control the operating system. But most people just go into WeChat and they live in WeChat. So it's like they've slapped another operating system on top of the operating system. And now you basically live in WeChat. So it's a bit of a disruption to these players who thought they were going to control the interface with users. It's kind of a gangster move, the whole mini programs thing. It's pretty neat, though. Um, last one. This is more of an Asia story. The two things I just told you, we could see those in the West. I don't think we're seeing them as quickly as we're seeing them in places like Asia, Southeast Asia, and Latin America is, is another one I'm keeping my eye on. Uh, the third idea is C to M, which is consumer to merchant. Cons I'm sorry, consumer to manufacturer. This is really an Asia story. It's a China story. Uh, the idea that like we're going to start connecting consumers not just with retailers but directly with manufacturers and that they can sell directly and i have a pair of uggs and i bought them 
from a retailer who got them from a distributor who got them from a manufacturer who made them because they had a license deal with the company and branded them Uggs. I can go directly to the manufacturer and buy a shoe that looks like the Ugg, but it's private label. So it's like you're cutting out the retailers and distributors and you can go direct. And these manufacturers that have been building toys, clothes, apparel, shoes, laptops, as contract manufacturers for major brands, often out of the West, are starting to offer private label products directly to consumers through these platforms, which the brands absolutely hate. And you know, I think they're suing them a lot because there's a lot of dodgy behavior happening. But this idea that you're a merchandiser, I'm sorry, a manufacturer based in Thailand, and maybe you have a food product, maybe it's milk powder, maybe it's shoes, and suddenly you can connect directly with consumers anywhere in Asia and reach them and market to them and hire a KOL and bring the KOL to your factory and do a tour and show how nice it is and just bypass everybody else. That's a, it's kind of a pretty cool move. I think that's going to be an Asia story because you can't do that in the U S because you have to be close to the manufacturers. You have to ship this stuff. You know, if the manufacturer is in Chongqing and you're buying it, in Wuhan, who cares? Like it doesn't take any time. Even Thailand, I can buy everything out of China into Thailand like it's nothing. So one, it's a direct model, it's cheaper. And the other thing it lets you do is it lets you move from going, it lets you move from being a mass manufacturer, mass retail, mass appeal products to customized products. Because if I can engage with the manufacturer directly, why do I want the same shoes everyone else does? Why don't I want shoes that are custom fitted to me? And they can scan my foot in a store. I can do it with an app and it'll get sent directly to the manufacturer and they'll custom make the shoes to my foot. But they could also custom de design the shoes. So this design could be only for me. So Jack Ma has talked about the idea that new manufacturing it used to be as a manufacturer, your idea was to create 2,000 of the same item per hour cheaply because that's how you get scale. Maybe the new manufacturers are able to do 2,000 different items per hour. And we all have individual clothes and individual cell phones that are only ours. And uh, you could see like on a cell phone, you could be on something like Taobao and you could say, you want some shoes, would you like us to custom design your shoes for you? And a little developer could come up in a window, I could pay for that as a service. You know, an individual designer in some other city who's got an art degree comes on, I talk to that person to design my shoes, then the manufacturer pops up and it's the service plus a product bundled as one price, it goes to the manufacturer and I get it in 24 hours. Shoes that look like nobody else's. That looks like it's doable. And it looks like in things like fashion, luxury, in a lot of areas, that's compelling. And I think that's coming soon. We already see the first versions of this happening in the last year. And the major players, Taobao, Jingdong, Pinduoduo, they're already on board and doing this. So it's going to happen. Once they're on board, it's pretty much going to happen. I mean, it's just the way things work. So that's kind of the third one I'm watching for is this C to M model to go from a very primitive idea to something much more robust. So those would be kind of my three. Watch for group buying, watch for mini programs, watch for C to M. I think that's kind of the frontier. There's other stuff, but those are the three I'm sort of most excited about. So how are we doing my time? I'm right on time. Right Thanks on money. time. Right on the money. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Chef, uh, uh, on the level for elaborating on, on these three topics. Um, so, guys, again, um, to all of you who want to submit questions, please feel free to use the Q&A function um, at the bottom of your screen. We will try to cover as many as possible. I would start off um, with a, one personal question before we dive in um, to uh, deeper into um, digital China. Uh, so you studied uh, physics, as I said, then you went to med school, did an MBA, worked in the Middle East. Uh, I would be really curious uh, to hear from you lot, like what fascinates you so much about, like how did you come to China in the first place? And what fascinates you so much about the tech environment in Asia? 
Yeah, I mean, there's not a lot of, I could rationalize it looking back that this all was a plan. It wasn't really a plan. It was just, I like to figure stuff out. I, I like to sit and think all day. That's what I do. I, I'm a terrible CEO. I've been a CEO like one and a half times. I'm awful. I'm just the worst. Like I do better when I just read and think all day. That's what I like to do. And then you execute a little bit, like speak, buy something, right? So I, I over time, I gravitated to interesting questions that I thought I could figure out that maybe were valuable and maybe some other people couldn't figure out. So that's kind of what I've been looking at. And uh, digital Asia, China is a really interesting question. There's a lot of fascinating stuff. So I get very excited about that. Um, you know, sitting in the clinic, checking, you know, children for ear infections all day. I got kind of bored with that very quick. So I, I just sort of gravitate to that. And then I ended up working for the Saudi billionaire who's wickedly smart gentleman named Al-Walid. And I, I thought I learned an enormous amount from him. And this was 15 years ago. And then this was sort of, it was clear that the developing economies of the world were gonna be a huge part of the story. I was in the Middle East, but I was looking at China and Asia. And I, I was pretty convinced, which is not rocket science, that in terms of developing economies, they're not all equal. I mean, Asia is just moving much faster. You know, the economy is massive. I mean, China's e-commerce spending dwarfs the rest of the world. You add the US e-commerce, you add Japan, UK, and the next six combined, it's less than China. So it's big money, it's moving fast, highly innovative, highly entrepreneurial. Uh, so I sort of placed my bets on Asia for the rest of my career. And I think that's not a big surprise. A lot of people did that. So I keep one foot in Asia and one foot in the West, and it's great. It's just fascinating. There's not a huge amount of logic to it. I just kind of do what I like and I'm good at. Sounds, uh, sounds great, Chef. Uh, we already have some participant questions, so I, I will just shoot them to you and then sometimes mix another one from, from my pre-prepared uh, questions. So the first one would, how, how do you see the mindset and attitude of tech entrepreneurs in China versus or in, or in Asia in comparison to the West? Like, do you see major differences when you talk to the people? I would say broadly that the, this is a generalization, right? So don't take this too seriously, but you know, generally the entrepreneurs out of China, Asia, mostly China is what I know best, uh, hyper competitive. It's just a much more ruthless landscape. You know, the, The analogy I use is it's like being an entrepreneur in the U.S. is like playing soccer, football. Being an entrepreneur in China is like playing rugby. It's just a lot more tough of a sport. So the people that get ahead, and plus there's just a lot more people. Everyone always talks about, oh, there's a lot of Chinese consumers. Look at that market. The other thing that population gets you is a sea of competitors. If you have a good idea in China, you're going to have 30 or 50 competitors within weeks. You don't get that in Silicon Valley. So it's just a much more brutal environment. So the, the people that get to the top are like these, you know, it's like that movie 300. You know, these people who are just bloody, who killed 100 people, and it's the only person left standing with a sword. That's Jack Ma. Like, you have to think about him that way. He's such a nice man, but he's a brutal competitor. Uh, it's just a tough environment. So when they start to go global, like TikTok and Huawei, you know, they're tough. Uh, now, U.S., other strengths. Elon Musk. I mean, look at that guy. That guy's crazy. He's just the best. <laughs> like, you know, so th there's, you know, I, th another analogy I use is it's like Steve Jobs and Bill Gates, right? They both competed their whole lives. And they were both very impressive, but they were different people, really, like different personality. Di I mean, they were just different. I kind of view like Asia and the West that way, that you can, you can find amazing people in both places. But they do tend to be different in sort of their posture. Totally, totally makes sense. Um, we have some industry uh, specific questions, for instance, one on the healthcare. So uh, your PE investments are also mainly in the, in the healthcare sector, uh, as far as I know. What are maybe some of the cool things you've seen uh, in, uh, in this industry? And the question from the participant would, would be, what's your take on the prospects of digital health in um, China? Yeah, I mean, I'm mostly focused on the West for healthcare. These, it's just a different part of life it, it, for me. It, it doesn't all fit together. I'm, I am bullish on healthcare in the United States because 
I mean, it's a staggering amount of money. I mean, it's 20% of the US economy's healthcare. It's perpetually messed up because it's inherently difficult. Healthcare is a very difficult thing, it's political. Uh, so I like it as a space just because it's complicated and people who haven't run hospitals or learned how to take care of people have a hard time understanding it. Um, this was the only time I ever made, like, I had lunch with Warren Buffett a couple of times with a bunch of students and he's a fun guy to have lunch with, but he's very hard to talk to because he's so smart. You can't say anything. Like, what am I going to say where he's not going to be like, yeah, that's not right. If I say, oh, Coca-Cola is like this, he, he knows everything. The only area where I thought I was smarter than him was healthcare because I've been doing it for a long time and he doesn't do healthcare at all. So that was like my one thing I got said that I got, he kind of thought was funny. I said, you know, I like healthcare because it makes all the really smart people like you uncomfortable. And he kind of laughed. He's like, yeah, that's true. Like it's a weird space, political, clinical, business. Um, healthcare in China, I'm not terribly bullish on unless it, there was a big push into digital health in China four years ago. All the venture capitalists jumped in. Digital health, the new thing, lots of funds. All the PE shops started healthcare groups in China. Most of that went nowhere because it's very political and it runs through the state-owned hospitals. And the supply of healthcare in China is overwhelmingly state-controlled. Government hospitals, government financing, and so on. Um, and that means it's just going to move at its own pace. It's not going to move at venture capital pace. It's going to move at government pace. The area that I thought really does work well is anything that's direct to consumer, like beauty treatments, dental, information, uh, ophthalmology, things like that. Uh, if you can sell things directly to people in China, it moves very, very quickly because they have a lot of money and they want better care. So a lot of the DDS, the direct to consumer stuff on healthcare is doing really well, but I would say most of the people that entered the space did not do well and they've shifted back to other things like entertainment. Uh, U.S. is fantastic. A lot of the innovation in the U.S. in healthcare is on the supply side. Hospital IT systems, uh, insurance, financing. In Asia, it's more on the consumer side. But cool. I guess that wraps it up. Um pretty well. Uh, the next question would be again a little bit more general from uh, Chano. He, he would like to ask um, to, to what extent can you witness like um, the, the new businesses in China really using artificial intelligence already in their operations? Yeah, this is, I mean, this is sort of my number one thing I'm looking at. I, you know, my number one question is I meet with these various companies in China or advisory groups or consulting groups or whatever. And I'm like, what is actually being used? Like, what are the use cases on the ground that people are implementing? Don't tell me the theory. I've seen the PowerPoints. No, no. I'm looking for use cases. And if you, if you ask Alibaba, what they say is, well, we use it in everything. Okay, true, but not true. Definitely on the consumer engagement. I mean, the easiest thing people are doing is just data transparency. Like, all these companies, manufacturers, retailers, distributors, whatever, all the information is scattered in emails around the company, in reports, in PDFs, in Excel sheets that people have on their laptops. You know, the easiest thing to do is just, you know, run the system, all the data gets scanned and put into one dashboard. So suddenly management can start to see really data visibility across their company in real time for the first time. And then they can start to make better decisions. Oh, I actually know where my inventory is every day. I didn't used to know that. You know, the purchasing manager knew some stuff and this warehouse person knew some stuff. So the first thing is like just data visibility. And that enables you to start doing basic predictions. We should buy more of this right now because we'll sell more and so on. So data visibility, early move. Uh, number two is like engagement with the customer get away from this idea of I'm going to just broadcast to customers and hope they like it with my ads and whatever. Start to get two-way communication with your customers and uh, start to gather data and start to personalize everything they see. We're very used to this idea that like if you go on Netflix, it's going to show you different movies based on who you are. Okay, products get personalized, but the, the visual interface 
of the store doesn't get personalized. Well, Alibaba is starting to do that. If I log into Alibaba, it looks different to me than it does to other people now. And then the communication you make, the offers, the coupons, the, hey, there's a discount on Nikes today, Jeff, because we know you like Nikes. Uh, the chatbots that come back to you and start communicating with you. How are you doing? They're starting to personalize that and what they will show you and content they will show you. And maybe they're starting to personalize the personalities of the chatbot. So they call it conversational AI. If you go on Jingdong, the customer service aspect of Jingdong, it's chat, it's voice, it'll show you pictures and stories. That's all conversational multimodal AI. The personality it adopts is a 19 year old girl, 19 year old woman, who's sort of sassy and up on the new things of what's going on. They have a personality because they don't wanna just show you things and solve your problems. They wanna make you happy. So they're, the AI is measuring not just what you called for, I want a new phone, but also how do I feel? and it's assessing my emotions and it's trying to solve both problems at the same time. And so they can start to customize this where every person will have a, you know, I'll say a different personality and they start to give every product will have a personality. Like I could launch a shoe wear line in China and give it a really sarcastic personality. So when you look at my shoes, it starts to engage with you and make jokes. So there's a lot of that sort of customer interface is becoming personalized and better tracked. Everyone's focusing on that, especially digital marketing within that. And then there's a lot of operational stuff. Just do things cheaper. If you ask Jingdong about this, they'll talk about customer service because that's very expensive for them and the warehouses. Alibaba will talk about logistics. So whatever business they were in, they're starting to go for efficiencies in their major cost center. That's kind of what I've seen recently, but it's moving pretty fast. Perfect. Um, let's go, let's go again a little bit in the, uh, you just mentioned uh, logistics and this would be another question of a participant to look a little bit into the logistics. So uh, Long Chima asked like, what do you think of the difference between logistic systems and its relation to the digital businesses in, in Europe or, or US, however you like, uh, and China? So, so do you see exciting stuff happening in the logistic uh, industry? Yeah. yeah, I think China is doing something new Japan is pretty good at logistics too, and South Korea is good, but it's a much smaller place. Um, what they're building is basically, one of the benefits China has is they can build common infrastructure across a one geography of a huge number of people, common language. They all use the same payment systems. They have the same regulations. There's a lot of benefits to that standardization across such a big population. One of the infrastructure types they're building across the whole country is a logistics network. And I asked Alibaba and Jingdong last year, what are the three biggest things you're working on? And both smart IoT logistics network. That was their word, smart or intelligent IoT logistics network. They're building, like say, Sanyao, which is Alibaba, they're building an infrastructure that covers every village of that country, warehouses, distribution points, on-demand delivery. They're digitizing the whole thing, IoT sensors, computer vision, standardizing the data so the whole thing is then connected. It's like building a national rail system and you mandate all the railroad tracks have to be this size so they can all connect. They're digitizing it, they're gathering the data, and then they're gonna open the whole thing up as a platform business model, the same way your operating system on your phone is open to everybody. And once they open it up, we'll see app developers come in and start writing software that runs on this national logistics platform because the data is standardized, the APIs are open, and we'll start to see maybe hundreds of thousands of apps that run on this network for anything you can think of. Businesses send a package from here to here, they do all these crazy things. That's sort of, so phase one, standardize, digitize the system. That's what they're building. A lot of automated warehouse, automated trucks, computer vision, IoT sensors. Step two, open the system to everybody and start to bring in developers and every type of business that can use this system. Step three, that's like your smartphone. Step three, 
start to infuse the whole thing with AI. So not only is it a national platform, it's becoming smarter and smarter. And the trucks start to move on their own. And the robots in the warehouse start to work on their own. That's the vision. It's really like, it's impressive as an idea. We'll see how far it gets, but they're both building. I mean, you can go to Alibaba headquarters and they have a big museum. They show you the new stuff. And there's a whole section on their logistics and all the trucks moving on their own into the warehouses. And it's a big idea. We'll see how well they do. But typically yeah, China is, is very good at infrastructure. When China says we're going to build like a million miles of whatever, it actually gets done. In the U.S. where I'm from, it doesn't really happen. <laughs> So. <laughs> Let's uh, stick for a second with the infrastructure because uh, I find this quite interesting. You just mentioned IoT and the rollout um, of 5G. You said China is really good in building infrastructure, but obviously the, the, the return on investment on like normal infrastructure, railroads, uh, uh, railways, roads, etc., uh, decreases a little bit. And uh, now the next big thing uh, might be uh, 5G. You also wrote with uh, Jonathan Wetzel, um, Uh, the the book the one hour China book where you describe the trend of urbanization like how does this like how do you see the future of Chinese cities maybe also like tier two tier three cities affected um, by the 5G um, outgrowth yeah I mean 5G is you know highly political now because of the U.S. China thing and um, that's in the press all the time which is interesting but you know the idea of 5G was it was it was It was moving fast in China, where it's still moving fast. Korea, Japan, I mean, these are the countries showing early adoption. I think some parts of the U.S. I don't know Europe as well in terms of 5G, what's going on. Okay, 5G, everything's faster, low latency. There's a couple of big ideas. I mean, there's this idea of like, what's, what's the use case for 5G? And you don't get a big answer to that question. Like when it went, when it went from 3G to 4G, suddenly our phones could do everything right? And suddenly we could stream videos. I mean, we, there's a lot that happened when that transition happened. And then you ask people, well, 4G to 5G, what's the big use case? Usually what you hear is transportation. That's usually the number one thing. Because if you're going to control robo taxis on the streets, you can't have a latency problem, right? There has to be an immediate response. Uh, I think Huawei has a very good answer to this, which is They are looking for an integrated solution. This is what they're trying to build, which is smart devices, your phone, your car, your tablet, your AI speaker in your home, your smart TV, whatever. A lot of smart devices connected, connectivity, that's 5G, cloud AI. And with the high speed, this can run as one integrated solution to do things that we couldn't do before. In theory, it could control cars as they move down the street in real time if the latency is low enough and the bandwidth is enough. So that was what I, you know, Huawei's pitch is we offer the integrated solution. We make smart devices, that's their consumer business. They offer connectivity, that's 5G, which they're selling. And then they're trying to get into cloud and AI, which I'm not convinced. I mean, Google and Amazon and Alibaba are much better at that, right? And the use case they always talk about is transportation and smart cities where China I mean, smart cities is kind of another big China idea where we're going to digitize the whole city. We're going to put sensors in all the roads and all the street lights, all the cameras. We're going to digitize everything, tons of little devices. We're going to standardize the data. It's all going to come to one control center in Shenzhen or Hangzhou or if you're Alibaba. And you'll be able to see everything that's going on. You can see all the cars tracking. You can see all the people walking. You can see all the traffic lights. And you can start to control the traffic in real time. And when there's a fire in Hangzhou, they can reroute all the taxis and change the lights in real time. And that's happening. And they're, you know, they've dropped their congestion rate. Hangzhou used to be like the number five or six most congested city in China. And Alibaba launched their city brain. And now they're like number 60 in terms of congestion because they can manage thousands of streetlights in real time based on what they're seeing. And the AI does it. And then they're going to do the same thing. They're going to open up the platform like your smartphone to app developers who can write apps that run on the city of Hangzhou. 
and they'll be in security, transportation, healthcare, waste. You know, you can put sensors in the water system and measure where the water is clean and where it is not. You can put drones in the air and measure all the pollution. And suddenly, if you are a polluter in China, it's very hard to get caught. You could just pump stuff into the air late at night, nobody knew. Now they have drones flying around and they can target, they can sniff the air and say that factory just polluted. You couldn't do that. So there's a lot of that stuff going on that this is gonna be a thing, which raises huge privacy concerns, obviously. Um, that's an interesting thing. So there's a couple of these big plays and uh, 5G in theory is gonna be a big part of the transportation end-to-end -end solution smart cities end-to-end -end solution. But a lot of stuff like, I don't know, is 5G really gonna make my watching YouTube on my phone that much better? Eh. I did see Huawei, I went to their, one last thing. I went to the Huawei um, virtual reality AI lab. And what they have is they have a virtual reality that runs on your phone. So you're sitting on the subway and you put on glasses and they're, uh, you know, they look like normal size glasses. They don't look monstrous. They look like shades, but they're a little bigger. And you put the cable into your phone and the 5G is so fast, it can stream virtual reality from the cloud, which takes a lot of data. And you can sit there on your phone while you're on the subway, just in your glasses, playing video games in virtual reality. That definitely sounds like a pretty epic uh, subway ride. Uh. <laughs> it, w it was actually pretty cool. Like... Okay, so with 5G, we can stream virtual reality video games to our smartphones. All right, that's not bad. Yeah, I think gaming, uh, gaming industry and whatsoever would be also an interesting topic, but let's stay one second. Uh, we just talked about the infrastructure, so let's go a little bit over to the brick and mortar business because you're all, all, also writing quite a lot about it um, and this like uh, online merch offline trend. Yep. Uh, you seem to be a very curious person and you recently you went to at JD Ski Space in Chongqing. Uh, can, you, can you maybe elaborate a little bit on that? What, what's behind that trend that they are also going offline, the big tech firms? Yeah, I mean, this is the OMO, right? Online merge offline. You take all the online assets, all the offline assets, stores, whatever, you merge them together into one seamless data-driven experience for the consumer. And the consumer doesn't care that they're online or offline anymore. It's just one experience that you go through. And within OMO, retail is going first. But healthcare is coming. Education is coming. You know, it's going to happen to other industries. It's just that retail is going first because China is really good at retail. So there's a lot of experimentation on this of what's going to work for OMO and retail and what doesn't. Luckin Coffee tried to merge, you know, you could order on your phone your cup of coffee. You get a little video, you could watch the cup of coffee being made in the machine, which I didn't really care about. And then it dings you when it's ready to pick up. Okay, who cares? OMO for retail coffee struck me as a big, so what? OMO for supermarkets is amazing. Like, you know, what Alibaba is doing is amazing because there's so many use cases where you know, you in theory in the near future can walk into a supermarket, your phone is in your pocket, you're just talking to your phone. Or there's a little cart next to you that follows you automatically and you just talk to the cart. Hi, Jeff, welcome back to the market. How are you doing today? I'm doing fine. What do you want? Are you getting some food? Oh, I'd like to buy dinner. Okay, how about this fish? We have a new fish. It was just caught 14 hours ago in Hanzhou. Uh, we have, you know, would you like this fish? We'll cook it for you in the kitchen here and have it you know, ready for you. Yes, that'd be nice, please do that, it starts to cook. Would you like us to do a certain recipe? We recommend this recipe for you. It's spicy, we know you like spicy food because we know everything about you. But we recommend you change item four from nutmeg to this because we know your family has someone who's allergic to nutmeg because they know everything about you. Yes, please do that. Okay, we've altered the menu, the ingredients, it's being cooked right now, it'll be ready in 15 minutes. Would you like it shipped to your home in 15 minutes after that? Or would you like to pick it up? And while you're waiting, would you like to go get a bottle of wine that goes with that? Go to aisle four, please pick that up. And you can get your haircut if you want, that's over there. And we can have this shipped, arrive, pick it up on the way home. 
And when it gets there, would you like to stream the Avengers? Because we know that you like the Avengers. It will all be there at once. That is merging physical products, physical retail, entertainment, digital goods, services like cooking, foot massage, haircut, and logistics because this retail space operate is effectively a forward delivery point for their whole logistics network. It's all of that in one thing. And I'll, as I'm shopping around, I say, oh, by the way, would you like a new pair of Nikes? We know you like Nikes. We don't sell them in the store, obviously, but we'll put them in your Taobao account. That'll be shipped to you in the next day. It's all one thing, right? Now, in a supermarket where you go every couple of days, that's very powerful, I think. So there's a lot of these use cases where you're like, wow, that's really, you know, that business model has a ton of use cases. OMO is very powerful in. Coffee one, eh. Fashion and luxury looks very interesting. Furniture sales looks very interesting. So certain sectors are, you know, JD is doing a lot of experimenting right now. So they have this e-space in Chongqing where you basically go to this big shopping mall. It's about four floors and it's experiential retail. They don't care if you buy in the store. All the purchases are done on your phone. They're fulfilled by the warehouse on the edge of Chongqing, which is a big distribution hub for JD. Everything in the store you can try. That's their thing, experiential. You want to come and try the smartphone, you can try the smartphone. If you want to try the new Canon camera, you can try the Canon and they have classes on how to do good photography. If you want to fly the drone, you can fly all the drones in the store. You can get on the scooter and zip around the store. If you're going to the makeup area, you can try. It's all everything you can try. The washing machines are plugged in with water. You can take off your shirt, put it in the washing machine, wash it in the store. Is that awesome? I don't know. It's interesting. But they're, they're moving in into an experiential space. And in some cases, the consumers really love it. In a lot of cases, the consumers don't care. In a lot of cases, the merchants are really what want it because they have a funky product like, I don't know, there was one group there trying to sell record players, like old record players. It is very hard as a brand to tell the story of why you should buy a record player. That's a complicated brand story. It's hard to tell that with a digital ad. It's hard to tell that with a billboard. But in an experiential store, the brand has an ability to tell a more complicated story. Let me tell you why these record players are actually vintage and cool and why you should get one. So in certain cases, the brands really love it because it's a way to engage with customers that is getting more and more hard, difficult online because it's, there's so much competition online to get attention. But in a store, you can have highly trained sales associates talk and explain, and hey, you want to ride the nine bot cart? You want to get in the little scooter and run around the store? Let me tell you. Know, so some cases, the power is with the merchant and the brand. And in some cases, it's with the consumer. I liked it. It was cool. I don't know if it's going to take off. I thought it was a good experiment. JD's doing a lot of these new experiments right now. The one I like they're doing, which I haven't seen yet, is they have little pop-up kitchens in the, in the metro stations. So when you're on the metro on the way home, you can order dinner. And as you get off the metro station at your stop, there's like a wall with little doors in it. And behind it is a kitchen. And as you get there, they start dinging you. You know, you're arriving in three minutes. Your food is in box two one. And as you get off the subway and walk, you open the thing and your food's just been prepared and you pick it up and then you go home. I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah, that's pretty epic. And then you can directly get the fresh, uh Rest uh, orange juice in the in the and they uh, time it right <laughs> 18 because they know when you're arriving and they know where you live and um, so there's a lot of this experimentation and sometimes you're like ah that's stupid that when you're like that type of omo for food service that's pretty cool like i get that's cool so let's yeah, it's uh, fun. do yeah. let's do two more questions and then um wrap up um so I would combine kind of two questions. I think it's a really interesting question on the internet in China, like uh, Eric Schmidt and some other US Americans kind of have to fear that it's really like two, will, will be like two separate um, internets in the future. So Martin would like to know, 
do you see China at some point opening up the internet market or will there be in the future like two separate internets? And I would combine that with Travis question on the future of VPNs. How, how, how do you see that? <laughs> yeah, VPNs is a whole question. Yeah, there's this idea that, look, at the app level, there are clearly different systems in China in the U.S. In some cases, it's nothing political. If you're going to do search, you need to search in Chinese. Well, Baidu is very good at China search. Well, better than Google. And if you're going to search in English or, you know, so sometimes it's just language. So we've, we're, we have seen separation at the app level between China and the West. The American companies have tended to become global giants. Google is everywhere. Facebook is everywhere. Baidu is not everywhere. Baidu is in China. Uh, and sometimes that's political. I mean, that's definitely true sometimes. Uh, so at the app level, then the question is, well, what's, what's going to happen in Germany? What's going to happen in Thailand? Are they going to go with TikTok, which comes out of China, or are they going to go with Facebook, which comes out of the U.S.? Turns out people like both, both are doing well. So there's a fight, often the, the interesting fight is not within China, I think, and it's not within the US, it's everywhere else. Like, what is Malaysia gonna go with? Okay, then you move from the app level, you start moving down the tech stack. And is this divide, how, how deep does it go? Which is kind of the question of the last year. Is it going to the data level? It turns out most companies like to store their data in their own country. German companies like to have their information in the cloud in Germany, and often the government will mandate it, that if you're going to do business with German or Chinese or whatever, you've got to keep your, company, your data local, or at least a copy of it. So data looks like it's kind of regional. All right, then you move down to sort of the infrastructure level. What about, what about the operating systems? Like what about Android versus iOS? Well, those are Western. But the U.S. just blocked Chinese companies from using Android. So China is now developing a third operating system for smartphones. Okay, so we might see some separation there. What about chips, right? That's the whole block Huawei. Now we see a huge amount of money going into, I mean, and chips is kind of a value chain. It's US, Taiwan, South Korea, China. It's, it's a, you know, Denmark. It's a huge global value chain. It looks like what I think we're gonna see is a simple answer. I think we're going to get away from this idea of one value chain that any one country controls because nobody likes that. We're going to see multiple supply chains for chips, for operating systems, for apps. And that is inherently less efficient, but people, no one wants to get cut off. If the U.S. is going to cut one company off from chips, maybe they do it to someone else. Similarly, the U.S. doesn't like being dependent on China for uh, pharmaceutical ingredients. So they're trying to diversify their supply chain away from that. So nobody wants to be dependent on anyone. <laughs> but I think we're going to see multiple supply chains. That's what I think. And um, the non-political countries like Jamaica. Jamaica doesn't care about any of this. right? They are happy with Huawei. They're happy with Ericsson. They're happy with Nokia. They're just going to pick and choose. And I think that's what we're going to see. We're going to see a sort of political stuff. And then we're going to see a lot of just pick and choose. They're like, they're, sorry, go ahead. So yeah, but this is clearly something that's, it's moved, technology has clearly moved into a more political arena than we've seen it before. Yeah, and, I um, would finish, finish the thought for you. <laughs> and VPN, was someone asked? Yeah. I don't know, VPN keeps changing. It's, you know, <laughs> you, you use a VPN, everything works fine, and then they all get shut down one week. It's like, all right, I need another one. Um, yeah, it, it's the VPN thing is a ongoing question within mainland China and some other places. My problem in life is Netflix also blocks you if you use VPN because Netflix, I guess, because of their contract, you know, when they buy IP from various property holders, they can stream it into certain countries, but not others. So they will block VPNs. So my trick is to find a VPN that can bypass out of China, but also bypass Netflix so that I can watch Narcos in Beijing. And <laughs> most VPNs don't make, you know, some VPNs do well here, some here, but very few do both. This is my problem, is uh, both of those. Yeah, it's an ongoing thing. Yeah, I don't know where it's gonna go.
I don't want to make advertisement, but at least last year, Aspirin VPN was uh, sometimes possible, uh, sometimes able to. Uh, I've used, uh, yeah, I've uh, used Golden Frog. I've used Strong VPN. I've used Express VPN. I usually have two because if you have meetings planned yeah. and then suddenly one of them isn't working for some reason. Yeah. Totally. I don't know. Um, Jeff, let's, uh, we have a lot of other interesting topics, uh, e-mobility, whatever, but uh, let's- um, we, we can keep going. I got some yeah. time. You want to keep going another 10 Lovely. minutes or so? I don't yeah. want sure. to cut off. That seems rude. Sure, sure. Um, then let's go maybe, let's, uh, let's do one question to internationalization because there was quite some, interested, uh, quite some interest from the participants in this one. So uh, you already mentioned, um, uh, ByteDance, like TikTok and, and Huawei. Um, how will this trend develop over the years to come, like this, this internationalization of Chinese firms? And, and what are some of the internationalization strategies you can see maybe also in emerging markets? You mentioned Latin America, but also Africa, there's a lot of going on. And what, what maybe less known Chinese tech companies you would look out for in the, in the years to come? I mean, the, the whole international thing, like, Everyone is very used to the idea that like toys are made in China. That was international a long time ago. It shipped. Uh, that has moved up to more high value stuff like smartphones. You know, most people's smartphones, the vast majority of the market share for smartphones comes from four or five Chinese companies and then Samsung and then Apple. Right. So that's kind of a type of internationalization. Anything that's sort of hardware plus software, smart devices, smartphones, smart scooters, smart TVs, uh, sm AI home speakers, uh, smart underwear, smart underwear is a thing, smart toothbrushes, that's a thing. So this combination of software and hardware, we see Asian companies doing very, very well, and that's Korea, Japan, South, and a lot of China. I think that's gonna continue. If you go to Mexico City, there are billboards for Oppo, Vivo, and Huawei everywhere. That's what everyone's using. If you go to Africa, they're overwhelmingly using Chinese smartphones. So we're used to that story, devices, manufacturing. But in the last year or two, we've seen mobile apps coming out of China doing incredibly well in places like India. So, I mean, you go to the Google Play Store of India two years ago and, you know, let's say of the top 100 Google Play apps in India, probably eight or nine of them were Chinese. You go today, it's about half. So we're seeing Chinese mobile apps do very, very well. Either they go directly, like, you know, they expand like TikTok, or one of these companies has invested in a local champion, like Gojek or whatever, Paytm out of, out of India, and they inject capital and technology, but it's a local solution. So that's a big deal. I mean, we're seeing you know, a lot of mobile apps coming out of China in particular doing very well. And I just think it's a more robust ecosystem. I think the epicenter of innovation for mobile apps is absolutely China. There are new mobile apps every week. There's new stuff all the time. The mobile apps we use for social media, e-commerce, communication, video, entertainment, they're just better. They are, Alibaba is dramatically better than Amazon now. WeChat is what Mark Zuckerberg is trying to do in WeChat, I'm sorry, in Facebook, looks like WeChat 2014. So it's just a more robust ecosystem. The entrepreneurs are great. The venture capital community is very aggressive. There's a massive consumer base you can sell to. So you get a lot of specializations. So I think that trend's gonna continue. I mean, when's the last time Silicon Valley came up with a consumer product that was good? Eight years? When's the last cool consumer app that came out of Silicon Valley? Airbnb, that's 10 years ago. Everyone's using Facebook, Twitter, Airbnb, Uber. Those are all eight years old, 10 years old. So I think there's a stagnation problem. I think the consumer side of digital, Asia, China, definitely, but Asia generally, I think that's the epicenter of mobile innovation for B2C. So I think this trend's going to continue. 
you, Jeff, you just said that also one of the drivers um, of the tech environment in China are like just the very tech savvy um, consumers and very adaptable. Um, so uh, I, I said in the introduction that you like Starbucks and for a couple of weeks ago, there was this broad case with uh, Luck and Coffee, yeah. uh, which yeah. was quite big. Um, on the other hand, the story I really, really liked um, from your from your blog was the story about Haiti and like how to create a hype in um, in China. So can you maybe like talk a little bit about the like explain the Chinese consumer and, and how to create a hype in China, maybe like given these two different stories? Yeah, I mean, the luck in coffee one is, you know, the truth's coming out on that one. People kind of knew what was up with them. They didn't know the extent of it, but, you know, there was rumors about that for a good year and a half. Uh, there was, there's sort of like this wave of companies that are coming up, hyping up, high growth, go public fast. As tech companies, it's like, is that really a tech company at all? I mean, you make and sell coffee. That, that sounds like a retail company to me. It doesn't sound like a tech company. Uh, we work. We're a tech company. Really? Kind of looks like you rent office space. You kind of look like a real estate company. Oyo, this hotel company out of India. There's been a wave of this, right? And it's kind of like, eh, okay. So if it's a traditional company, then like doing a traditional retail company, a CPG company in China is really hard because there's a sea of competition, right? There's a million, I mean, there's more than a million. There's like 3 million restaurants in China. It's hyper competitive. Winning in that space is very difficult. I'm terrified of doing restaurants in China. You know, my old joke is like, you know, going to China to compete in restaurants is like going to Kenya to compete in long distance running. Like, it's, you don't want to run there. It's, they're amazing at it. So, you know, when Luckin was launching, you know, my question was always, well, what's their traffic? Do people like their product or not? Chinese consumers don't really like Taco Bell. It's been opened twice in China, never did well. Chinese consumers didn't really like Krispy Kreme. It was open, they had these beautiful stores, they're all closed. They just didn't like the product that much. So it's always like, how popular are you? And it looks like coffee is not really that popular in China, not yet. It's getting, it's going up over time, but it's slow. It's a very difficult space. If people don't love your product in China, Dude, just it's life is too hard. You don't want to be like mediocre. You have to be amazing or or don't do the business. And Hey Tea, which is a counterexample, launched these tea places that are basically tea companies that are like Starbucks. Nice locations, very beautiful, very stylish. And they have these teas, fruit teas, and their famous one is cream cheese tea. It's cheese tea, which is really good. And there's lines out the door. So I'm like, that's what you want. Like if you have lines out the door, good. You're in good shape in China. If you don't have lines out the door, I, I'd be a little worried. So Haiti is doing great. They're not opening fast though. I mean, they're 100, 200, 300. It's not 2,000 a year like Luckin. It's a tough space. You know, there's a lot. You go into any street in China, in any town, there's restaurant, 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 restaurant. There's tons of them. Yeah, it's, I, I don't like to compete in that space at all. But hey, tea's doing great. I've, I've hung out with their people. I tried all their teas and they're great. You go to the airport, like in Beijing, and there's a hey, tea. 9 p.m. at night, there's a line out the door in the airport terminal. So it's like having a hit movie or something. It's like, all right, good for you. So yeah, I totally agree. And, and even, even if there's no line at hey, tea, like 200 people ordered online, probably. Um, so. Uh, the so, waiting time is long. Um, let's let's do one last content question, and then there are like two more personal questions from the audience, like to your person. Um, let's do one time the the fintech thing. Yeah, so many people in the West know about WeChat Pay and Alipay. China is basically a cashless society in 2020, but there's also a lot of other cool things going on in the fintech space, and also like the the, the government. Uh, there there are some reports on on building like a blockchain um, cryptocurrency. Could this be like a real threat to, to the existing payment systems? And what other cool trends have you seen over the last time in the fintech space? Yeah, I mean, I, I only go so deep in fintech because it's a specialty and it's you know outside of my expertise at a certain point. Uh, a lot of regulatory aspects I don't know about. Yeah. 
the company I watch is Ant Financial. I think Ant Financial is a potentially like $500 billion company where you know, they're, they're building the ultimate super app for everything you need financially in life. And they've got 1.2 billion users, 900 million who are in China, another 100, 200 million that are in Asia mostly. You know, but they're offering payment solutions in the Philippines, Thailand, Myanmar, uh, Indonesia, Singapore. I mean, they're, they're going global very aggressively and they have been for several years. And a couple things that I think are cool. Like one, is there a, you know, they're what we call an AI factory. There is zero human operation where the core service they do, like I would like a loan consumer credit to buy this product. You know, their mantra is three, one, zero. Like it takes three minutes to apply. They make a decision in one second and there's zero humans involved in that decision. So if you're on their service, three minutes to apply, you're immediately approved or not approved and you, nobody is involved. Banks can't do that. Banks have loan officers, you know, so they can scale up in a way that no bank could ever scale up. They don't have that many employees and they're rolling out this sort of, AI factory that where barely the software does all the core decisions and operations without humans slowing it down. So if they can get that rolling with payment, loans, supplier credit, consumer credit, insurance, wealth management, the whole suite of financial services products across a billion people, that's devastating for a company like MoneyGram or Western Union or American Express that depends on making three, four, 5% transaction fees to send money between Hong Kong and the Philippines, uh, which is good because I think these companies deserve to get disrupted. Uh, so uh, see how much traction they get, but in Asia, they're moving very fast. And I think they could be a major disruptor for the whole um, payment space in general and maybe banks maybe wealth management. So we'll see. I watch that one a lot. And then there's this other stuff like the, the global currency or the Chinese digital currency that they're rolling out, the e and b which is happening this year, sort of. Uh, I don't know how, how seriously to take that. I've been watching this idea of sort of a super app for everything financial service you might need in life. Uh, Alibaba just announced on Tuesday, Monday, no, on Monday, mon this week, that they have a Alibaba.com, which is their B2B business, connects SMEs in the United States and other places with China. SMEs in the United States have a cash flow problem because of COVID. And they just offered a financing product where you can basically buy supplies from China. You bring them into your store and sell them and you get 60 day payment terms from Alibaba. It used to be if you wanted to buy stuff from China, they're not usually gonna ship the good out of China and put it in a warehouse until they get paid. Now Alibaba is offering a financing solution so that they can ship, get paid, and the buyer doesn't have to pay until 60 days after, and the merchant is guaranteed to get paid. That's a pretty powerful move, I think, for cash-strapped SMEs in the US. So there's a lot going on there that's cool. That sounds indeed um, quite cool. And uh, let's stop the content questions here. We have some more questions like on the, um, on some, let's call it uh, career advice and on, on your career. So maybe let's uh, put this all together. Um, kind of my question would be, uh, you, you said already that you went a couple of times to Warren Buffett with your MBA students from PKU. And you also, you guys also talked about career advice. You guys, uh, like to all the participants, you can watch it on YouTube, on Chef's YouTube um, channel. Um, so my question would be, you started your career back then as a management consultant. Um, when you were, when you would uh, like graduating again, what would you do nowadays? Would you go again for management consulting or would you do something more tech savvy? Yeah, I mean, let's assume we're talking business, right? Not other careers. Um... I think if I had to do, I mean, I kind of figured it out as I went along because I was a guy coming out of medical and my family didn't know anything about business. I didn't have anyone to, I sort of stumbled around and had to find how things work. I understand how things work now, but I didn't back then. So if I was starting over now, 
I would, a lot of it's personality. Like I, I, it took me a while to figure out that like, I'm not really a good operator. I don't like to run things. I like my ideal day is to sit alone with a cup of coffee and read and think. And that's just a personality type, which some people have. Buffett talks about this. This is why I follow this guy so much because he talks about that's his ideal deal, his ideal day as well. So, oh, I, I'm like, oh, I'm like that. I should, I should see how he does it. Most people aren't like that. Most people like, you know, so if you're going to, if you're kind of like that, you're a bit more of a, let's say an introvert type, then things like investing, writing, teaching make a lot of sense. Uh, deals where you spend 90% of your time thinking and 10% of your time doing. Uh, if I was like that, um, a lot of those people like to go in venture capital. I think there's too many of those people who don't add very much. Um, I would probably end up just going classic investor route. Uh, more probably, I wouldn't do hedge fund because I don't think they add enough value. I'd do something like private equity where you're, you're able to not just buy a company, but you're able to fix a company. And that's kind of what I learned from my old boss, the Saudi prince, is I learned how to fix things. Like being a mechanic, not, not unlike being a doctor. If you can fix a company, people call you all the time because they have a problem. We invested in this company. We don't know what to do. It's not working. The CEOs quit. We hear you're good at turnarounds. Would you, they don't negotiate you on price at all. It's like no one negotiates with their heart surgeon. Like be the heart surgeon, be the person they call when they've got a problem. So I like that sort of being a very fix it sort of person. That would be probably what I would do. I would be a very surgical turnaround guy. And I'd just sit in my office and wait for people to call me. Please come, we, we have a problem. We're losing a million dollars a month. We don't know what to do. Everyone said you're the guy. Uh, okay, most people aren't like that. Let's say more traditional MBA who end up going, most of my, I teach this online class called Jeff's Asia Tech class, which is, if you want to sign up, go over to jefftausen.com. There's a free 30 day trial. Sign up, see if you like it. It's free uh, for a while. And then 30 days, you don't like it. You can't, you know, keep going to cancel. And I mostly speak to executives and MBAs and students who, who know they're going to be in management mostly, right? Which is different. So we just talk about like, I would sit at something that is at the intersection of regular business and digital, like retail, digital marketing. I think digital marketing is great. I would be the executive at whatever firm you like, like let's say you're an automotive. Okay, if I was an automotive, I would be the executive who understood AI and that everyone calls because it turns out AI is in everything. I would, if I would be the person at a CPG company, like, well, let's say Adidas, Adidas, there's a German company. I'd be the person at Adidas, the executive who understood digital marketing in Asia, because that's, that's where most of their growth is coming from. Digital market is always changing. Most of the senior executives don't know that stuff. I'd look for some combination of a traditional industry and one of these frontier skills related to digital. So digital marketing, AI, platform strategy and depending what business you're in like if you're going into banking you want to be an executive at deutsche bank dude be the person who understands you know what ai can do this year as opposed to last year and the year before i'd, I'd look for that to sort of move myself quickly up the ranks of the executives if i could that's probably what i'd do it's a good skill set it's yeah. complicated uh <laughs> It helps if you're doing something that's really important that most people don't understand. But that's a good, that's a good strategy for getting ahead in your firm or you know in life. Uh, Perfect. Thanks, Seth. So I think now we have uh, career advice for both introverts and extroverts. Um, let's look ahead uh, as a last question. Um, you you just mentioned your uh, Asia Tech class. You're doing quite some different stuff, but. Uh, really, uh, like, well, like, what are some projects you want to push forward? And you already wrote four books. So, what will be the fifth book about? What would be topics you want to look deeper into? Um, I'm I'm focused on the frontier of digital. Like, I'm trying to be digital meets strategy. Jack Ma meets Michael Porter. 
that's where I sit. And I started out with books because that's what you used to do in life if you were like that. I'm more focused on podcasts and videos and uh, sort of working with executives over years. Um, you know, talking every week. Here's most of this stuff. It it takes time to understand it. You don't read one book and get it. I think that's a remnant of an earlier age of publishing. I think things like long form podcasts, which is what I'm doing now, um, where you speak an hour every week to people about something. I think if you do that every week for six months, that's how someone gets from, I don't understand this stuff to, Hey, I really, I think I got this now deep content over a longer period of time. I mean, that's kind of how you learn stuff like a language. Like you don't read a book and learn to speak Japanese. You practice every week for six months. And then at the end of six months, you look back and go like, oh, I kind of speak Japanese. That's fun. I, I, that's my approach now for all of this content stuff. So that's my little online class and the podcast, which is free. And uh, I think that's, I, I'm not sure I'm gonna write more books. I'm not sure books make any sense anymore. So we'll see. Cool, cool, cool. cool. And I can really highly recommend uh, your podcast to our audience. Okay, looking at the time, we we definitely come to an end now of the event. So first and foremost, a big uh, thanks to you, Jeff, um, for taking the time today and being our guest. Um, as Jeff already mentioned, for all of you who want to learn more about his work, go to Jeff Thousand. Dot com. You can get the 30-day free trial. You can also follow him on LinkedIn. What I really like, he's uh, publishing a lot of interesting content on that. Or if you want to learn more about um, China in general and business trends, you can also read his older books, which are, I would say, still up to date uh, when you read them. Um, yeah, that being said, also big thanks to all the participants for joining us. Uh, feel free to subscribe to our newsletter to stay tuned for future events. And uh, you will also get a feedback mail. We would really appreciate your feedback in order to credibly improve um, our format. And that being said, take care of yourself and your loved ones, and we hope to welcome you soon again. Seth, thanks to Bangkok. Um, take mm -hmm. care of yourself and uh, talk soon. Thank you very much. I appreciate it, everybody.